Now I'm turning my attention to the Telecheck CRT substitutor. If you recall, I picked up two of these. One of them is in rough shape and I think has a damaged yoke because some of the leads were clipped out. Um, but it has a built-in speaker and my nicer one that I've been using in previous videos does not. So I'm going to swap the speaker out to the other unit. Maybe clean up some of this corrosion in the process. I have not looked inside of this before, but I can see it has a switch for direct versus transformer, so I suspect it's got a permanent magnet speaker, or maybe two separate ones. So let's see, we have an oval one up here, and it looks, and it looks like there's two speakers in there. And one of them will have an output transformer on it, and one of them will just be a direct connection to the voice coil. This one short, uh, too bad there's one corner that shoot up a bit. It's not the most sturdily constructed of devices. Oh, no. <laughs> they fooled me. There's nothing down there. Small permanent magnetic speaker, output transformer. And a switch. A frozen switch. Should some contact cleaner in there. Probably hasn't been flipped in a very long time. Everything's got a nice patina of corrosion on it. So the idea is I want to clean this up and mount it into my other telecheck. And then try using it with the set, both the CRT and the speaker. Here it is, transplanted into the other telecheck unit. Now it's just a matter of hooking up all the wires back into the set. What do you think? Is it going to work? It's been a while since I turned it on. Let's see. I think I got it all hooked up right, including the substitution transform, or speaker rather, in the transformer position. All right. The speaker works just fine. Handy thing to have for sure. So previously, I'd taken the speaker out of the set and. You know, Whenever you take the speaker out of a radio or TV, you're always risk damaging it, so it's a very handy thing to have. And the set is working good, but not the sharpest picture for sure. However, I am using my little own homebrew transmitter, which is over there, and I'm just using some random length wire for reception antenna, so what I want to do is feed a stronger, cleaner signal into the set and uh, see what kind of picture I can get. If your gums bleed when you brush, you may have gingivitis and the clock could be ticking towards bad breath, receding gums and possibly tooth loss. Help turn back the clock on gingivitis. Some of you may have noticed some junk on the screen. Well, it was starting to drive me nuts, so I figured it's time to uh, clean this thing out, and it gives us an opportunity to take a closer look inside. So this is the CRT, something I've referred to in the past as a test CRT. What it is is an 8-inch black and white picture tube that's kind of designed for servicing TVs. By that I mean it's a bit more rugged. With respect to the electron gun design, it can handle, I believe, an excess of 20,000 volts. And it also does not require an ion trap, but it does not have an aluminized screen. It's just a straight electron gun. No nonsense, straight through. What that means is no ion trap magnet to fool around with, no focus coil. 
Downside is it will develop a burn in the center of the screen. I've seen some of these that have seen a lot of use and there's definitely a brownish or dead spot in the center of it, but it really doesn't matter because you're using this as a substitution for the main CRT just to get the set working. Because now and then I see people thinking, oh, I could use these uh, as a replacement for an 8-inch picture tube and, and, uh, and a TV and use it as a replacement picture tube. You can, but it's going to get an ion burn in the center. Now, as for the rest of it, uh, crudely made, as I mentioned earlier. So, here's the plastic front. It does have some crazing. There must have been some pressure applied to the front. And it's got some stress cracks in it. Cleaned it as best I could. I don't want to get too aggressive. You can see the paint's already coming off on the other side. Those lines are painted onto the plastic. Ah, so this mounts into that. There's just four spongy pads that have gone kind of rock hard on the corners to hold this secure. And there is the yoke that goes around it. That goes off to clip leads that are attached to the set. That deflects the electron beam in the horizontal and vertical plane. There are two nested electromagnets in there. And uh, some more plexiglass for support piece. Goes out of these wooden dowels. More crazing. Don't know what type of plastic this is, but clearly not meant for very rugged use. And here is the socket that goes on to the back of the CRT, so really not a whole lot to it. In fact, it's entirely possible to use this without the, the box, as you've seen me do in much older videos, where I uh, just got an 8XP4, similar to the 8YP4 over there, where I didn't get it in this nice carrying case. It's just a bare picture tube, and you simply stick it in place of the full-size one, you just stick it through the existing yoke and connect the CRT socket to it. But it's nice to have this box and these leads, especially for these sets that are uh, designed to have much larger picture tubes that are permanently mounted to the cabinet. Or I shouldn't say permanently mounted, but so large and bulky that you really don't want to take them out of the cabinet if you can possibly avoid it. I think the only tube I hadn't tested was the high voltage rectifier. I generally don't like to go poking around in there if I don't have to because it can risk damaging the fine wires on the flyback, including breaking off that plate lead. But I was very careful. Extracted it. It's a no name 1K3. It calls for a 1B3, but they're pretty much interchangeable. Anyways, it tested pretty weak. So I'm going to put in a new old stock. 1B3, and uh, cause I, I think the high voltage was a little on the low side, so let's see if this helps. So, finished the recap, checked the resistors, checked tubes, even swapped some tubes in the IF and tuner. Because I'm just not happy with the performance of this set, it works. Uh, but as you can see, Vertical needs to be readjusted periodically as the set warms up, which gets annoying. Also, the picture is not as sharp as I'd like it to be, and I suspect the two may very well be related. I'm adjusting the contrast right now. All the controls do what they should. Brightness, contrast, so on. Uh, there's a local distance switch, which changes the gain. Um... But, check out this image, which is not that sharp, and keep in mind this is only an 8 inch picture tube, the one that's in the full TV is 21 inches, so typically when you use these smaller test CRTs, the image is even sharper because it's, well, smaller. And especially with these test CRTs, because they are auto-focusing, uh, the, the uh, image should be quite sharp. So. I am still poking around. 
Now, one problem with this setup, when you use a TUS CRT, is you've got these wires hanging around. I'd like to check some voltages right now to make sure everything's within spec. Kind of hard to do when I've got a high voltage lead hanging out here and all these yoke wires clipped in and stuff. So it's one disadvantage I, to, to using this kind of setup. But what I can do is rearrange things. So what I want to do is get it so that this is on the other side of the chassis because I want to get down on these boards, especially that one. So the output, the tuner is right up here and the output goes right to this. This is the video IF and video amp. And the output of that goes to the sync circuitry. So I'm thinking either that's misaligned or something is not up to spec in that circuit. I'm not getting the bandwidth or I'm not getting the gain uh, that I should be getting. So I'm going to try to rearrange it so that this is over here and a high voltage lead is well out of the way. The other thing you can sometimes do is disable the horizontal, like to take out the horizontal output tube uh, so, so you don't have the high voltage to worry about. Um, I don't like to do that if I can avoid it though because I want to make sure that the set is working properly and all the loads are there and, and such. Um, so uh, I'll do what I can and uh, I'll get out my schematic which I believe has uh, voltages indicated on it. And uh, I printed out the whole SAMS with uh, all the um, alignment information as well. It's pretty straightforward, except uh, I do have to modify um, a tube in here. 6J62, we need to clip off pin 1 and then pull the tube shield away so it's floating over the tube and then inject the signal into this, or clip the, the RF generator onto the shield which will then be capacitively coupled inside of the tube and then feed through the set. did that once before, I think on a Dumont. And I, uh, basically, you have to kill the tube to do it. And I had did that once before. I don't know what I did with that tube, so I probably just have to sacrifice another 6J6. Not the rarest of tubes, so not the end of the world. Um, and then the, uh, once that's done, uh, the alignment procedure is pretty straightforward. Also a bit of buzz in the audio, now that's partially because I got the speaker right on top of the flyback, I think. And uh, I've got the, the volume control hanging down here, going kind of by the high voltage circuitry. This stuff should all be pretty well shielded. But also there is a buzz control on the top side of the chassis. That board down there is the audio board, so I can adjust that as well. Something else I'm trying to address now is the tuner. I had noticed it was quite loose. Well, it turns out it's only held onto the chassis by two sheet metal screws. And uh, the real problem here is they used similar insulating washers like I'm used to seeing on old radios, something like this. Or it's got a piece on either side, it goes through a hole and has a slot cut in the side. Well, the original ones are completely rock hard and rotted away. So these are ones I've picked up over the years for radio restorations. Perhaps these will work. Otherwise, I might have to get a little more creative. Use something like this, which are like uh, plumbing washers. And put one on either side. I think I finally found a combination that will work. At first I tried using one of these reproduction grommets I got for a Filka radio, but it was too soft and a little too thick. So I went to the Home Improvement Center and got the smallest size grommet they had, which is perfect diameter, but it's a little too thin. The screw was bottoming out, so a little more hunting around, and I found that this works pretty well to use a hard rubber washer like for plumbing plus this. I'll show you what I mean. Take this guy out.
basically consists of a few parts. There is a screw that goes into this metal sleeve. Grab it, it goes in like that. That goes into this, which is actually a pretty large hole. And that old one, <laughs> the one I tried using, it was too mushy. So it's actually a, a fairly large opening here, that's why you've got to use a grommet. You can't just use, say, something like. First, I, I tried using one of these on either side and the screw, but uh, you really need to have the sleeve because the idea is you want to keep this electrically isolated from the chassis. So, what we do is take one of these. And unfortunately, the hole is a little too small, so I enlarged it with a screw, just going like this. Doesn't take too much effort. So why go to all that trouble? When well, after all, this sub-chassis is ground, this chassis is ground. Why not just bolt the two together? After all, they are connected together with this heavy braid. Well, I can think of three reasons. One, this sub-chassis is aluminum, I do believe, and this is copper-plated steel. You have two dissimilar metals attached together, you can get a uh, galvanic corrosion. Two, uh, to eliminate ground loops. If you have several points of contact between metal services and there's any current running through them, some connections will have low resistance than others and can set up ground loops and cause problems of interference. Three, microphonics. The speaker attaches to the cabinet, this chassis attaches to the cabinet. You get the sound cranked up, the cabinet's going to vibrate a little bit. That fed through to this. This is the mixer oscillator tube, which has some delicate elements inside. If this is vibrating, that can feed through and you get sort of like sound interference inside the picture. Okay, so I got things rearranged so I can safely test the voltages on the bottom of the circuit boards. I ran uh, 
the test CRT and the leads out through the center hole there and uh, high voltage leads going off to the side so I can get down in here just gotta <laughs> watch that anode cap I actually already did brush my knuckle kinda near and got a little bit of a zap not lethal but uh, it'll wake you up so one thing I noticed right away is all the voltages are a little low so going all the way back to the power supply should be the highest potential at 265 and that should be let's see Got the SAMS it's on there multiple pages here that should be 290 so not surprisingly all the other things the 280 volt source the 155 source everything's about 20 volts too low okay um, and that's with my PR70 set for about 117, which is what the, the spec out in the schematic. Okay, it's a little low, but set should still work fairly well. The filament voltages are dead on. I did swap out the 5U4 thinking that might be a little weak. Uh, but it's still, that's, you know, within like 10%. However... I then started poking around uh, the boost voltage. So that's generated by the flyback action in the damper tube. So boost 520, goes to a couple dropping resistors, and then goes to a number of things including the vertical output transformer, the yoke, and so on. And that should be 440 volts. Well, what have I got? 288 and that also happens to feed uh, I believe it is G2 on the CRT so that would definitely cause a problem with the focusing on the CRT on the, uh, the lack of sharpness so it might not be the IF or the tuner or any of that it might very well be that boost voltage so a little surprising because I do have full vertical deflection. However, I am using a little itty bitty eight inch test CRT. If I had the full CRT, I might very well not have full height because that boost voltage goes right to the vertical output transformer and one side of the yoke. Uh, and that's very typical of these sets. Also goes to the center wiper on the height control. Uh, typically on these sets the B plus just doesn't have enough juice to get full vertical deflection so they got to boost it up a little bit from the flyback. The 288 is a lot different than 440 so what could be causing that? Well most obvious thing could be uh, those two 18k resistors which I did replace. Uh, on the other side of them should be 520 and there is a point one microfarad cap going to 280 that is that yellow guy up there so my meter can safely handle up to a thousand volts so I should be able to probe that just don't want to get near the high voltage so that's the other side of these 18 k so here for 11 night not quite 520 so one thing that could account for that is uh, it could be a weak horizontal output tube, or I could try adjusting the drive control. Excuse my uh, three page SAM schematic here. <laughs> get kind of annoying at times. Uh, sometimes I tape these together. So typically, this is a photocopy of a SAM's photo effect, and quite typically, they have the schematic uh, spanning three fold out pages. So that's why I've been flopping around. Anyways, there is a horizontal drive control. It's very typical on these sets. It is a variable capacitor, and that couples a sawtooth signal to the grid of the horizontal output tube. Basically controls how much drive voltage is going to the horizontal output. Uh, more voltage you feed into that. Uh, higher the voltage you'll get out of it. So I'm going to try tweaking that a bit and see uh, if the vo boost voltage goes up. That is that trimmer cap right down in here. I believe I need to adjust that from the other side with a screwdriver. Uh, 
Okay, so you guys have watched that boost voltage while I try to adjust the drive with this long flat blade screwdriver. It is not at all easy to get at. It is next to the vertical height and linearity controls, which are also quite awkward to get at. So, let's see here. Okay, I've located it. Now I'm going to go clockwise. Let's see what effect that has. Hmm, not changing it a whole lot. That's, so I got to tighten down about it as far as it will go. I'm going to back off. I'm not doing a whole heck of a lot. Uh, remember way back when I did have a dead damper tube and I replaced it. Hmm. So well, that is uh, definitely something I can try doing is swapping out the damper tube. Uh, there aren't a whole lot of parts in the circuitry down in here. And, uh, I can't honestly say I've got a whole lot of experience with the boost voltage being really low. So again here's the schematic. So flyback winding, put on my microfarad cap, uh, a couple resistors. Uh, is anything connected to no to that side? Just the resistors, and then uh, possibly since this is not exactly the right yoke, it's the one the substitute that could be dragging things down a bit. Possibly. Uh, you place that electrolytic and then it goes to height control, linearity control, another filter cap, and uh, the vertical output tube. Or no, sorry, that, that's on the other side of that uh, filter cap. So, uh, not a whole lot of things it goes to, really. And then, of course, uh, the CRT, which really has no current draw. It occurred to me there is one other thing I can check, and that is the high voltage. So I got my trusty high voltage probe here. And that is only 11.5 kilovolts. It should be about 15 and a half nominally. Now that is also very much affected by the drive control, so I'm going to try adjusting that again and see if it will affect it. Can't uh, really adjust that while I've got the meter connected so I'll have to go back and forth a little. So that was with it all the way down. I'm going to back off the drive control a little. Maybe points to either the horizontal output tube or associated parts. Uh, again, when I checked all these resistors, um, like that's the horizontal output tube there, and they're all still all the original resistors on there. They all check good, but usually when I work on a set, the first thing I one of the first things I do is shotgun the horizontal section. Uh, it's critical to the operation of the set, and it gets. Uh, 
it's driven kind of hard in some sets but I didn't do that on this one and I wonder if that's causing some issues it's a little strange though that adjusting the drive control uh, is having so little effect usually it's pretty pronounced I mean that's another remote possibility is that the drive control is uh, this variable cap is no good. Point four. Well, I'm going to do the simplest thing first, which is replace horizontal output tube. Now, I recall this tested good, but man, now that I'm looking at it again generic no-name tube and it's seen some use so I just happen to have what I believe is a new old stock 60Q6B General Electric so I'm gonna pop this guy in and see what we get okay checking the high voltage again hmm tube is not lit up at all <laughs> so it came out of a sleeve uh, when I when I open this up I noticed that what's in here is not necessarily what's on the box so this is actually a Curtis Mathis so these might actually be poles that are in these rather than new old stock yeah, Dumont that one looks pretty fried too well that's annoying. Channel master. Mm, clean pins on them, but the tubes themselves are kind of dirty. I don't even see a get oh getters on the top of this one. So hmm. Well, I better keep poking around and see if I can find some better 60Q6s. I swapped out a bunch of 60Q6s and it made minor differences tried about four different tubes but nothing substantial so I started working my way back through circuitry 6DQ6 uh, pin 5 is right about negative 26 pin 4 is about 135 so I think that's fine so I kept working my way back got the pin 6 on the horizontal multi vibrator and it's only about 140 volts should be 255 so something's up there so um, I took that two, uh, that 82k resistor, and I'm also thinking that 68 or 680 picofarad cap, or maybe a mica cap may have gone bad. Usually they don't, but anything's possible at this point. And also that 5600 ohm resistor. The other voltages on it, the, the 10 volts and the minus 13, are not too far off spec. Well, here's the sweep board that does the horizontal and vertical circuits. Here's a 680 picofarad cap. It does test good, as does the 82K resistor. However, I realized that I still haven't replaced the horizontal AFC diodes, and that couplet there is a vertical integrator, and it's got kind of a weird blob. It kind of looks like maybe the original was clipped out from the top and a new one tacked in. And a vertical hold on this thing is flaky. Uh, it's also very, very hard to work on this board. Because of the shield down here, the shield up here, horizontal hold control, big power transformer off to the side. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this board out. There aren't that many wires attached on the bottom, and it'll make working on this a whole lot easier. So I want to rebuild that vertical integrator, I want to test more of these components more thoroughly, I want to replace that selenium AFC diode, and uh, it's just getting to, uh, to be way too hard to try to uh, work on both sides of the boards in the middle of this big chassis, so out it comes.